Why are words in some languages so long while others they are so short? Is it because people first writing the language couldn't figure out where one word started and the other one began? Or is there something more going on? Linguists used to think that the shorter a word was, the more often it was used, and the less it was used, the longer it was. This seems true when you look at English, where the most commonly used word, the, is made up of two phonemes, and many other common words follow this pattern. But this starts to break down as soon as you start looking at a language outside of the Indo-European sphere. You start to see words such as Hungarian that are long but are used relatively frequently, Vizon Letasra, or goodbye. It actually turns out that the longer word is, the more meaning it carries. It has nothing to do with how often it's used. This Hungarian word is actually the formal version of goodbye, or Vizlat. It was so long because it was carrying more meaning. What's super interesting is there's actually some languages that just generally make bigger words, and we call these languages synthetic. The definition of synthetic in terms of language gets pretty messy, but basically it starts out as all of this is synthetic, and then kind of splits into agglutinative synthetic languages or fusional synthetic languages. Agglutinative languages are going to have a ton of different building blocks you can use to create a word. So each word could potentially have a lot of content and information depending on how many blocks you use in a word. Each building block can be any length, but typically they are on two phonemes or two letters long. Each building block contains one specific piece of information such as if, if it's plural or if it's referring to you or me or we or he or the past or future or anything else for that matter. Fusional languages, on the other hand, tend to be languages like Latin, where you can have a huge declension charts. Instead of having a bunch of building blocks to make words out of, you have a bunch of interchangeable parts. You completely transform one morpheme into a different morpheme to change meaning such as person, tense, and number. Take this example in Spanish of the word veo, where the O means first person, present, singular, indicative, which are a lot of things, but then if you just change it to ves, it then means second person, present, singular, indicative. A small change, but it changes a relatively large amount of meaning. Polysynthetic languages can be both an agglutinative language or a fusional language. It simply means it's the far end of fusion or agglutination, so it's going to have extremely long words or extremely complex words, or most often a combination of both fusion and agglutination. On the other side, there's analytic languages. Analytic languages tend to use specific particles like of or the or a uh instead of endings to change the meaning of a sentence. In analytic languages, words tend to be shorter and there tends to be more words than in a synthetic language. English is actually an analytic language. Isolating languages are a more extreme form of analytic languages. Isolating languages typically have one word to one morpheme, and each of these words are distinctively separate words, because they can be moved around in a sentence and are pretty flexible in their positions. Some notable isolating languages are classical Chinese, less so modern Chinese, and Vietnamese. Almost every single language takes elements from all these different categories. So in English, we're generally classified as an analytic language, but then we have some features that are pretty synthetic, such as adding endings to indicate plural with an S or past tense with a D, like subscribe versus subscribe or subscriber versus subscribers. More analytic features in English are that we can make super long words such as neuropsychopharmacology, which are usually only found in agglutinative languages because, well, there are tons of morphemes strung together to create one word where each of the parts can't really be split apart. You can't split pharma away from the rest of the word and put it somewhere else in a sentence. It won't work. It wouldn't make sense. This monstrosity is also an English word. So why isn't English considered agglutinative? Because these words seem to fit in all definitions of agglutination. It's because most of English follows the analytic approach, where we use lots of connecting words like the, of, or a. Uh. These extremely long exceptions are pretty niche examples that show the history of English back when English was still a synthetic language. Many other languages change categorization over time too. You can literally see this in French. French is notorious for dropping almost all the letters at the end of words. French words are written incredibly long because they used to carry all that meaning, but now all that meaning is just left in the written form because they have begun to drop sounds. But this change is not because French speakers are lazy, as some people say, but it's because they're changing from a fusional language to an analytic language. Most languages aren't purely fusional or analytic or isolating. They're usually a mix of all the areas nearby. Take that Spanish example that I had earlier for how a fusional language would work. Spanish isn't a fusional language, but I was still able to use a word from their language as an example of fusion. This is because it kind of spans between analytic and fusional. It's mainly analytic, but it has some fusional elements. It's kind of like how English is analytic, but still has some agglutinative properties. Most languages aren't purely fusional or analytic or isolating. They're usually a mix of all the areas nearby. So, there it is. 
That's why some languages have few long words and other languages have many short words.